Hey there, team. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we have an earthquake to discuss. There was a magnitude 7.1 quake that took place in southern China on January 7th at about 9.05 local time. This quake, unfortunately, has proved to cause thus far many fatalities and injuries. So this is a very serious uh, situation we have right now. I want to start with sort of the just the facts and the human aspect and then I want to get into the science a little bit. So thanks again for joining me. So the quake here in question again January 7th about 9.05 a.m. local time. Uh, it was a magnitude 7.1 at 10 kilometers depth. It happened here in the Tibet region just on the north side of the Himalayas. So here you can see India, Nepal, Bhutan, and this is China, the Tibet region of China. And I've located the epicenter right here. It's about 50 miles or 80 kilometers north of Mount Everest, which is right about here. Um, and this is a high elevation region. The Tibetan Plateau is a high elevation uh, region. The elevations here are four to 5,000 meters or about 13,000 to 16,000 feet in elevation. This quake was felt with its shallow focus. This quake was felt over a large area. So it was felt not just in China, down into India, uh, in Bhutan and over into Nepal as well. And I want to give a quick shout out to Amanda Joe who helped me compile some of the information I'm going to present here today with this update. So far, as of this video being recorded, we have reports of about 126 deaths. Um, from Reuters, about 188 injuries, but those lump numbers are very likely to rise. So let's look at the uh, information from the USGS and some of the news agencies, and then we'll get into some of the science and um, why this earthquake took place and some of the dynamics of it. So you can see here, USGS, of course, does not have seismometers in the area, but when we have these larger earthquakes, we do pick them up. So there's that 7.1 quake, the main shock, and these other smaller orange circles here are the aftershocks that have come in. But this is just showing the biggest aftershocks. So we're getting the 4.9s, the 4.4s, the 5.1s. So generally, 4s and 5s are the only ones uh, that we're able to detect with our USGS seismic instrumentation. There's likely a lot smaller and more numerous aftershocks taking place there as well. Uh, let's start with the human aspect and then we'll circle back to this as well. But again, you can see the 7.1 magnitude and our modified Mercalli scale, the intensity level is anywhere between a 9 and an 8. Uh, again, the preliminary reports from a very uh, remote region of the world coming to the USGS site. So that's, you know, to take, be taken with a grain of salt, but that gives you a bit of an indication of how serious the shaking was from this quake. So here's a Reuters article that's pretty recent that shows some images more than anything that I want to just highlight. I'll put a link to this as well in uh, the description so you can uh, take a look at it. But here we have some of the, the damage from these. So you can again see the type of homes here and the, the rigid construction materials that are used, which unfortunately just don't fare well in earthquakes. Some of the rescue work going on there amid the rubble. Uh, and this is all taking place, I'm sure, uh, right now. This is in Kathmandu in Nepal. So not as strong a shaking there, but enough to get people's attention and people uh, came out of their homes. This is also in Kathmandu. So um, people responding to the earthquake, um, here is Shigatsa City. This is much closer to the epicenter of the earthquake. This is about uh, 100 miles or 170 kilometers away, one of the holy Tibet's holy cities with about 800,000 people living there. So you can see some of the intense damage there with the building uh, material collapses onto the streets and such. Uh, so some pretty sad images coming out from the region and again uh, hopefully things will go well the aftershocks will most likely continue um there'll be probably landslides were triggered and avalanches in the high mountains associated with this and sometimes those can have their own sets of hazards as well and of course there's no tsunami here there's no water body to just where water to be displaced and probably very little liquefaction as well this is a very arid rocky region so very small likelihood of anything being triggered on that front so that's sort of the nuts and bolts of what took place so far um, but let's talk spend most of our time here as scientists looking at why this took place so most of you know uh, that there is a plate boundary between India and Asia this is a convergent plate boundary India began the Indian uh, 
tectonic plate began colliding with this part of the Eurasian plate about 50 million years ago, and that collision uh, is still ongoing. So most people know the basics here, where India, you know, moved forward and collided with Eurasia. Um, but what's maybe not quite as well known is that as India has collided with Asia, uh, on the to the west, that's a very stable block of thick resistant crust. Um, but as the collision has taken place, it's allowed this area of the Tibetan Plateau and areas of Southeast Asia have actually moved off to the east. So there is a pretty complicated structural geologic setting here with not just convergent faults like thrust faults, but there's strikes up faults. There's even normal faults in this area as well. And so this is sometimes called uh, escape tectonics, or this area has not just strike slip motion or horizontal motion on the faults, but also extensional motion as well. Here's a nice little model uh, that was put together that kind of shows how this works, that if you buttress this side um, and, and drive something into it, you get the material escaping out to the sides. And here you can actually see some of those, those strikes up faults that would be produced there. Um, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of this quake. The thing that was surprising to me is having seen, you know, maybe a handful of these over the years as, as a geologist is the ones at least I remember, I'd have to go back and really dig in. Most of the ones I remember in this region tend to be on strikes up faults or sometimes low angle thrust faults, compressional faults. And this one, if you look at the moment tensor solution, the beach ball here, this is a obvious normal fault. So this is a north-south striking fault. So the fault is on the map would go north-south. And this is either a east or west dipping normal fault based on the seismic analysis and the fault plane solution. So that's different because we associate normal faults with um, with uh, extension, right? And this area is being extended, but that's not what you would maybe expect at first glance when you think about India plowing into Asia and some of the um, the convergence and compression that's taking place there. Here's a, uh, let me make that a little bit smaller so it fits there a little bit better. Uh, here's a graphic from an, a paper that shows the, the GPS velocity. So all these little um, arrows point to the direction that the ground is moving over time and you can see you know again india plowing northward or northwest or northeastward into asia here but then you can also see the way that this area to the east side of the tibetan plateau is sort of escaping or or squeezing out or leaking out to the east in response to that compression so that maybe hopefully illustrates a little bit of the dynamics and what's going on here uh, again i'm no expert on tibetan geology or the you know, this area per se, but I was able to find at least one paper that talks about um, this eastward escape of central Tibet. And they found this, uh, this was, this was recently October, 2024, uh, a thousand kilometer long fault that was unrecognized. They used um, LIDAR and other aerial imagery and surveys to actually um, see this fault that was sort of unrecognized previously and they were able to get some dates on it and slip rates and how often it moves that sort of thing um but to show you that the the structures are actually quite complicated here let's actually make this one a little bit bigger perhaps so here is the the plate boundary i suppose the the front the southward front of the Himalayas here. Here's Mount Everest to give you some sense of scale there. And so you'd expect a lot of the structures to be sort of east-west trending. And that's true. A lot of these strike slip faults, can we zoom in a little bit more? That's maybe about as far as I dare go. Um, but these red lines are faults and you can see a lot of them do have this east-west trend to them. These are the strike slip faults. You might be able to pick out the little arrows there on either side of that. But there are also these sets of normal faults that run more or less north-south. So you can see a set here. And this one here is pretty close to where, this is about where the epicenter of this earthquake was. And so it's very likely, but not conclusive, that this fault or some set of faults nearby was the, the cause of this big earthquake that occurred uh, within the last 24 hours. So you, you do see some of these other structures, these normal faults that are north-south trending, uh, as opposed to these, you know, more, more or less east-west trending strike slip faults, and then of course the, the thrust faults down here. So there is some precedent for, you know, extensional faulting and large uh, earthquakes from those faults in this region, even though, you know, by and large, it's a compressional or a convergent setting, uh, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. So, um, 
anyway, so that's sort of my my take on things thus far. Um, and so hopefully that's somewhat helpful. And we'll have to see. I'm sure more news will come in in the coming hours and days. We'll hope for low numbers for the fatalities and such, but it's they're likely to go up because we're still in the early stages of this event playing out and, you know, rescuers getting to people and finding uh, people and helping people out. So hopefully the, the numbers stay low, uh, but I wanted to give you just my perspective on this very large and, and tragic earthquake that took place uh, just today, uh, January 7th, and some of the science behind it. So thanks again for your support of the channel. Uh, appreciate you coming here and watching these videos and sharing with me and learning with me, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much.